Dawn Holder, uh, and she's going to speak about her work here, monoculture. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate everyone coming out today to see the show. Um, I just want to give a quick Thank you to the Arkansas Interlaw Committee for supporting me and for Courtney Taylor for curating me into this great opportunity. I feel really thankful to be a part of this show. It's really exciting. Um, so what I want to talk to you today first um, is about just sort of the history of the lawn and my interest in the lawn conceptually and then a little bit about some of the aesthetic choices that I made in the piece, and then maybe a little bit about process, because I think people tend to be really curious about that as well. Um, so the lawn originated in Western Europe, primarily in England, um, as a manicured park-like space in front of manor homes. And uh, this was, of course, before the invention of any type of lawnmower. So if you were able to have a grassy lawn, um, you had to have a group of servants that could go through with a scythe and cut it by hand. And you had to have enough wealth uh, to pay them to do that. And also enough extra land that you could also have your farmland and your pasture land. And then this was just extra space purely for show. Um, so it's very much um, rooted in the idea of status. Um, and in, uh, in America, we didn't really start having lawns until um, the, the 20th century. In, in the mid, uh, say, 19th century, um, some wealthy landowners started to emulate the idea of the lawn, but it um, had a similar function in that it was all about status and very few people were, were able to have a lawn. Um, in your house, you would normally, or around your house, you would normally just have a dirt yard and a garden that would be used for food. Um, in the early 20th century, with the invention of the real mower, a uh, little push mower, um, lawns started to become a little bit more popular. And then, um, we started to have some suburban developments um, in the interwar period. So lawns became more popular at that time. And then especially right after around World War II, um, around 1950 when Levittown, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's one of the first giant suburban developments of about 17,000 houses um, in Long Island. Uh, that's when the, the lawn really became popularized. And in fact, the, the developers of Levittown during the very first spring offered to seed and mow everybody's lawns um, as a way of kind of propagating that idea. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting that lawns are rooted in this idea about status. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting the way that our idea and perceptions of lawn have evolved in America. So if you think about it, it's not just about status, it's about class. Are you wealthy enough to buy into the suburban American dream? It's about morality. Um, if you are that person who doesn't take care of your lawn, you're a bad neighbor. That is, like, maybe you're corrupt, uh, morally bankrupt, that you are not taming your natural space. Um, and this is just kind of a funny side note. Growing up once, um, our neighbors put a sign on our lawn, handwritten that said, you know, like, lawn of the month, as a joke, because we weren't doing a <laughs> job of manicuring our lawn. And I, that looked fine to me, but. <laughs> um, it's very interesting that we have this idea of morally policing each other about creating this perfect idealized space. Um, there are also connections to our expectations of gender. Who's supposed to mow the lawn? Mm -hmm. so, right, men. Um, and so uh, almost all of lawn care products are marketed towards men. Um, they're about efficiency, productivity, um, and that ability, that sort of virile strength of going out and taking care of the lawn. And um, 
interesting, like a corollary to that is gardening is often marketed towards women. So we're the sort of cultivators of the flowers and the vegetables, and the, the men are the ones out there mowing down that gosh darn lawn, you know, <laughs> keeping it under control. So I think it's really interesting how we have all these different cultural stereotypes about the lawn and about how we use the lawn. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of us don't even really think about or question. It's just sort of how it is. Um, and, and then another aspect of the lawn that I think is pretty interesting and relevant today is um, the environmental impact that it has. So you're not allowed to have any weeds. And like, what is a weed? A weed is just something that we've determined doesn't belong in that space. That we have to go and rip out. Like, I find dandelions quite lovely. I don't really see the problem. But if you wanna have a, like, a true perfect lawn, you cannot have that. You know, so it's one kind of grass, it's, it's this mono, monoculture of a plant. Um, you have to use pesticides and chemicals to fertilize it, and then you have to use a lot of water. And I think that's really relevant in places like California today. Um, you know, just the amount of resources that are being used to create this beautiful grassy space that takes time resources, labor, and then how many of you actually go out and use your lawn? <laughs> I mean, maybe if you have kid, young kids, maybe they'll play outside on the lawn, but for the most part, it's something that takes our time, our energy, you know, and then it's, it's all about creating this illusion of this perfect, beautiful space of us as powerful humans that can control our environment and conform to this idea um, of this happy, park-like, suburban universe that we live in. So I'm really interested in just kind of raising the question of, is this the best idea? <laughs> um, why don't we have plant our yards full of blueberry bushes and, you know, things that could actually be useful and delicious. Um, <laughs> or, you know, um, there is a movement of doing um, like zero scaping, so using desert plants. Um, why doesn't our lawn or our, front, our yard reflect native plants? So, so I'm interested, I'm very interested in, in investigating um, how our culture chooses to manicure and manipulate the landscape around it. Um, okay, so I think that's enough of the, of the background. Um, aesthetically, I was really interested in creating a piece that was actually very minimal. Um, you might be able to see that I'm influenced by some of the minimalist artists, especially Carl Andre, with his thin, flat, um, floor pieces, I like the way that the piece displaces sort of all of the space around it. Um, the material that I use is porcelain. It's incredibly fragile. So keep off the lawn. <laughs> In fact, I should probably have a, a sign that says that. <laughs> um, but part of why I like porcelain is because of its fragility. It is a very delicate material. Um, it's very responsive to my touch as an artist, um, but I like that metaphor of fragility um, as part of the piece. So this is something that is cultivated and manicured, but it also can easily be destroyed. Um, and a lot of this piece for me has become about how do I take care of it? How do I preserve it? How do I transport it? How do I touch it without destroying the piece? Um, so it changes how I interact with the work. Um, and I think it also affects how the viewers interact with the work. And I think that's very interesting. Um, so this is actually just a portion of the, um, of the grass that I've made. I've made probably about 1,100 squares. Um, it's made in four by four squares. Here is um, 360. 
Um, so there's actually more grass, which is good. <laughs> In case something happens. Um, Are those back up, or do you go other and other exhibits have the full 1100? Um, one thing that I like about the way that I've constructed it is it's modular. So I can respond to the needs of the space where I'm um, installing the work. Um, and I've installed this in different variations. Um, sometimes I'll leave negative space, just um, an empty strip that would imply a sidewalk. I thought that this piece you know, in this space would look better as just one large block. Um, in other installations, I've also left space for a driveway, sidewalk, and then um, a walkway kind of implied up to the front door. Mm -hmm. So it's really fun depending on the space I'm in and, and how much area I have to work with, I can create um, different sort of implied lawn spaces. Um, and then... Some of them break when you're installing them? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very expert with super glue. <laughs> <laughs> who makes the who makes the crumbs, the porcelain crumbs? Who makes it? Yeah. I do. Oh you oh, you make the porcelain yourself? Mm -hmm. oh. Um yeah, so as an artist I work primarily in clay. I use other materials as well depending on the project that I'm working on. Um but all of these blades of grass are handmade. Mm. Um so when I develop a project like this, the beginning of the project is just experimentation and I expect to fail. Um, many times before I figure out how to actually manufacture the piece. And then I have to set up a workflow that's kind of like a human factory. Mm -hmm. So I manufactured blades of grass for over a year um, working on this piece. Um, I use uh, press molds and then, um, so I'll roll out a very thin sheet of clay, press it into my mold, which is corrugated, so I can get that nice kind of pull in the middle of the grass. And then I have some big flat blades that I use to chop up the grass. When the clay has firmed up, um, I'll take the little blades and plant them into a soft slab of clay. Then it dries, it's fired, um, I dip it in glaze and then fire it again. Gosh. So there's a lot of process, there's a lot of room for things to go wrong. <laughs> um, the glaze is um, something that I developed in my studio. I like to do a lot of glaze testing so that I can have exactly the right color. Um, so I probably tested about maybe a hundred different glaze recipes 